Happy Monday to everybody. We officially are starting our second month of Coffee with a Farmer and or Resource Manager. And today we are live from the field, which is going to be very special with Joe Del Bosque. We're from Del Bosque Farms in Fireball. And we're going to be meeting him in just a bit. But as we always do, we're going to do a round robin around the state with all of our coordinators for the farms program and start with a question about, uh, in this case, what was your first job? And, and in, this, in this scenario, it is not a job where you are working for your mom or your dad or your grandparents and, or not getting paid or maybe you're getting allowance because we all, a lot of us did that and, and uh, worked on the farm for many years without being paid. So this is a job where you actually are being, being paid by someone else and maybe even, you know, getting a getting paperwork and tax information and things like that. So my first job, I'm Mary Kimball, I'm the executive director of the Center for Land Based Learning. And my first job that was kind of off site off of the farm was I worked for a local nursery in Woodlands, California. And I did things like water the plants and I did sales and reception, you know, that kind of thing. And it was a job that I had also, I could use for my FFA uh, supervised occupational experience program. And uh, it worked out very well for me. I ended up, because of that job, I think I really moved uh, into the plant science world. So I worked there actually all through high school, three days a week after school. So it was a great one. All right, I'm gonna move to Dana. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dana Baker, the Tehama County Farms Leadership Coordinator, and I'm coming from Red Bluff. And my first job, not working for my parents, which I did a fair amount of, um, but I worked for one of our local paint horse breeders, and I not only cleaned stalls and did all the grunt work that way, but I also worked my way to where I was um, exercising and fitting them. They showed primarily halter horses. So those horses spent a lot of time getting groomed and being lunged. And so that was the first uh, job that I had that actually got paid and had to clock in and clock out. Um, and I think I may have spent every penny I made on a horse from there. <laughs> so, um, Perfect. But, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, Joseph. Good morning. My name is Joseph Montoya. I'm the Farms Leadership Coordinator for the Sacramento Valley. Um, so, aside from odd jobs here and there for you know, parents, friends of the family, uh, things of that nature, um, it was actually Hollywood video. So, you know, maybe that's a little bit of a blast from the past for somebody. I mean, I feel like, you know, that's on this call, probably know, but I don't know, maybe, maybe not some that don't know. But um, Hollywood video was a place where there were originally VHS tapes and then DVDs and then some Blu-rays as they closed um, and then you would go there and it was a store and you would just rent video games or videos and you would have them so for a certain amount of time. I don't know why I'm explaining it, it goes going into this, <laughs> but that's what it was, Hollywood Video. Hollywood Video, excellent. I remember Hollywood Video very well. All right. Good morning, my name is Katie Wartman. I am coming to you from Fresno, I'm the Central Valley Farms um, Leadership Coordinator. And the same with Joseph. I worked in a small video um, coffee shop store in the small town that I lived in. So um, yeah, I'm not gonna go into it because nobody knows what the Blockbuster is or anything anymore, but yeah, you rent videos and so. <laughs> okay, Romy. Good morning. My name is Romy Wattenberger. I'm the Kern County Farms Coordinator here in Bakersfield. And mine would be, I worked at a wedding venue, which it's actually ours, but I still got paid. So um, I'd work either as bartending or I would just help people just um, clean tables and help and all that kind of stuff. It was fun to get to see everybody's different wedding and their pipes and all that kind of stuff. It was a lot of fun. That sounds like a fun job. <laughs> All right, Letsy. Good morning. My name is Letsy Hernandez. I run the program in Monterey. In County. Um, my first job, I actually had two jobs at the same time when I was younger. 
and um, um, I used to do daycare and or watch watch some of the neighborhood kids. Um, and then I used to also put together fundraiser packets, and it, it was a really well paid job actually. And all I had to do was just like staple the papers that would go to the schools, um, and it'd be like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, but yeah, that, that's. Those were my first jobs. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, good, good diversity there, Alessi. I like it. <laughs> okay, Joe, you are up. I'm going to do a real quick intro of you and then you can take it away. So Joe Del Bosque is uh, somebody who I've gotten to know over the last, say, four years uh, as a real leader in agriculture in California in a lot of different ways. Uh, number one, he's a real advocate. So he's out there all the time talking about the issues in agriculture uh, and natural resource conservation. He is active in many, many local organizations and foundations in the Fresno region. He's an advocate for agriculture education and, and for hands-on education. And he also is an amazing farmer which is why we're talking to him today, of course, with the Coffee with the Farmers. So Joe, I'm happy uh, to have you on today. You've, you've, you know, you've walked the fields with President Obama and a lot of other people that are a lot more important than us, um, but I, I really appreciate how you've, you always make yourself available. Very, very busy person, and you always make yourself available to anybody who, who wants to talk about what's going on in agriculture today. So thank you so much for joining us. And tell us, what was your first job, Joe? Well, good morning, and thank you for having us here. Um, it's just, it's a great day out here. And um, on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley, you can see a little bit of the view behind me. You can see that. I'm standing, yes. in, a, standing in a sweet corn uh, organic sweet corn field. Uh, so I'll tell you, my first job actually, I've never left the farm. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I started off there on the farm where my father worked. He was a he was a, a foreman, a ranch manager, and so I grew up there. Um, after about three years of working there, they started paying me, and uh, I worked all through uh, school, saved my money, went to Fresno State. Uh, paid my way through school with what I earned and then after Fresno State I came back to work on the same farm he was working for and and I became a manager for for the the next 10 years after graduating from college mm -hmm. that and is of course funny. yeah so and of course after you. that I started my own farm yeah so that's what I was going to say perfect segue into telling us about um, your farm and all that you grow, which is really amazing, all of the diversity that you have and kind of some of the markets that you have. And, and so just, just give us a little, like a little snapshot of Del Bosque Farms. Sure, uh, today we do, uh, our biggest crop is, is organic melons. Uh, we do can cantaloupe, honeydew, specialty melons and mini watermelons, all organic. Um, we added to that program uh, organic uh, asparagus, uh, organic sweet corn, and now we're doing some organic hard squash. Um, mm. In addition to that, we also do some almonds like everybody else out here on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. We do a number of acres of, uh, of almonds, but they're not organic. Sure. And so tell us a little bit, too, about where does, where does all of this product go? Where does it, uh, we talked a little bit about this before, but, um, you know, what, what supply chains does it go through? And, and tell us where it ends up in the country. Well, I'm most involved with the marketing on the organic melons. Um, that's a program that we started in 2004. And uh, immediately we caught uh, the attention of a retailer called Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. um, that was in 2004. We had already already been growing conventional melons for years and years. Well, actually, since I was a kid, my dad was a cantaloupe grower. But they came. Uh, but Whole Foods came out to the farm. They wanted to meet me and, and see what we're doing. And uh, so we began um, a, a long relationship with Whole Foods. But as we developed the program, we added more customers. And our organic melons go all over the country and also including to Canada. We are probably the largest organic melon grower in the country right now. And we go wow. across the country. Uh, 
chains that you may know besides Whole Foods. We do Trader Joe's, we do Publix in the Southeast. We do some to Wegmans in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. We do Safeway. Um, we do uh, in Canada, Loblaws. We're all over the country. I, I don't even know where or how they get there. <laughs> and, and so when, uh, when Whole Foods was, was sold to Amazon, Changes, or do you expect to see some more changes as this all unfolds? Well, at first we were a little concerned because um, Amazon is not a produce company, right? So we didn't know if they were going to understand the produce business. But, uh, but we see that as a potential uh, expansion of our market because they do a lot of direct-to-customer sales. Mm -hmm. And so we see that as, as a huge potential distribution for our products uh, and, and we think that we're in just the right position for that. Whole Foods has been, uh, you know, they've been, they are our largest customer. We are their largest provider of organic melons and that has been growing every year. In mm -hmm. fact, I think in 2009, we increased like 20% from 2000. I mean, in 2019, we increased 20% from 2018. So wow. we're growing little by little with them and with the rest of the uh, country. And what is the number one selling melon for with Whole Foods? Is it cantaloupe? It's cantaloupe, yes. Okay. And I, I've yeah. been out on your fields when, the, when you were in harvest and you, we walked along and you opened them up and we tasted them and they were amazing. Um, I can see why those are your number one sellers. And I know today you're doing some planting is the planter near you right now, Joe? The planter is going to fill up with water right now. He'll okay. be back in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, we'll be able to see it. He's just planting right across the road from me. Okay, so you let us know when he's getting closer and then we can sure. uh, move over and get a, a really up close view of what's going on there. That'll be a lot of fun. So what about the sweet corn? You're, you've got sweet corn in your backyard. Where does that go? Yeah, this sweet corn here, um, we just started sweet corn about three years ago. And um, same thing, we're trying to actually incorporate a rotation crop for our melons. Um, one thing about the area we're in is that water is very scarce here and we often get water reductions. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a whole world that I talk about very much. Yes. Um, and so um, we can't afford to grow just any crop here because the water is so expensive and scarce. But we found, we found that sweet corn is a good rotation crop for our melons. Our soils need that. And so we are gradually uh, developing that, that program. And, uh, and I think it's going to do, I think it's going to do well. So actually, you know, that brings something up. Um, I don't think anybody yet in the last month has talked about crop rotation and what a rotation crop is, actually. So could you, this is something I remember learning way back in, you know, in high school agriculture, uh, and it's certainly in college in uh, plant science, crop science, but could you explain kind of in a, in a real uh, basic way what rotation, what a crop rotation is and a rudder? case a specific rotational crop and why you would use it? Sure. Uh, since most of our crops are in the family of plants called cucurbits, cucurbits includes melons, watermelons, cucumbers, squash, and so forth. And they're in one family and, and we have fields that we have been repeating melons and watermelons, you know, for years. And we need to get out of that and get into a little bit more diverse uh, change. And we think that corn being a, a, a cereal crop, a grass crop, is, is a, a, a nice change because if you continue to grow one crop in the same place over and over again, you start to develop diseases in the soil that affect that crop. And if you uh, put in something totally different like corn, uh, you disrupt that, that, uh, that pathogen life cycle and, uh, and you kind of keep pathogens at bay doing that. So it's very, it's very good to do that. Also, the corn is a, is a huge, you know, it, it, it's a big crop. A lot of plant mass is developed by the sweet corn, which, you know, we only harvest the sweet corn and everything else gets plowed back in the soil. And all that organic matter is great for the soil. 
And that's something that we're all always uh, cognizant about is, is the health of the soil and getting organic matter back into it. That's great. I, I remember um, in college, I you know, studied integrated pest management and crop rotation was of course a part of, of uh, IPM. But I know that you have practiced IPM for a long time and you've gone even further. Can you talk about some of the things you've done with your pollinator strips and your hedgerows on the farm? And if there's any in the vicinity of where you are, all right, so we, you know, back in the late 90s, we were, when we were growing cotton, we got involved with a program from actually up in your part of the country, Marsha Gibbs. Marsha Gibbs. Had, she, she ran this program called the Sustainable Cotton Project. Yeah. And basically what it was, was uh, they were trying to introduce farmers to methods that would help them uh, become part of their integrated pest management and reduce their reliance on pesticides and also using less um, uh, less harsh pesticides pesticides that were easier on on in, on beneficial insects and bees and um, and so through Marsha we learned about using hedgerows in our crops so when we started doing organic melons in 2004 it was just a natural thing to continue using those hedgerows. And, uh, and these hedgerows, which I'm going to show you here, if you can see that behind me, mm -hmm. right here. This bed yeah. here, if you can see it has three rows. Um, it, has, um, it has sunflowers, it has buckwheat, and in some cases we'll also plant some corn. Mm -hmm. And these, um, these things help to harbor beneficial insects. Insects like ladybugs, lace wings, um, big-eyed bugs, and so forth that help control our pests in the melons. So we'll have one row of these in between every planting. So that's basically one row, like for every 15 acres of crop. And, uh, and at the same time, these uh, uh, hedgerows pro pro produce flowers which help to feed the bees, the pollinators, because we will bring pollinators in to pollinate the melons and the squash. Uh, we don't need to pollinate the corn, but the bees love the corn because they pick up a lot of pollen from the corn and that's good feed for them. So these hedgerows provide a lot for us uh, into our program and, and we, we follow this very faithfully. Yes, I know, and they're beautiful. And so when, when you drive by your farm in the summer, you can always tell Del Bosque fields because they have these beautiful rolls of flowers in them that are not just pretty, like, I mean, they're pretty, like you said, but they also are doing an incredible job for those native for those. They right, need, so but They need but, that uh, floral nectar source to Yes, by the time we bring the bees into the melons, which is probably in about three weeks, some of these plants will be flowering already. The, the, the early one to flower is the buckwheat. It'll have flowers and, and the, the bees will be pollinating the melons, but they will also pick up some food from the hedgerows. So we kind of make the timing so that, that uh, it, it, it coordinates with beneficials, pests, and bees. So on the beneficial insect um, side of things, Dana, you had a question. You want to ask Joe your question? Sure. Joe, do you guys actually release beneficial insects to your fields or do you rely on them coming naturally? Well, both things. We do buy beneficials. We buy a lot of beneficials. We buy um, ladybugs by the gallon. <laughs> we buy lace, lace wing eggs. Uh, we also buy trichogramma, which is a, it's a parasitic wasp. And then we'll also later in the season, when we have issues with, uh, uh, with whitefly, we will uh, buy some uh, whitefly parasites. So uh, those things work very well with our hedgerows. We, we, we release them actually in our hedgerows because the hedgerows provide a habitat for them. And uh, the hedgerows are typically, they're, they're going to grow to be five or six feet tall. And, and that will be, they also, these hedgerows actually attract pests 
which is good because instead of going to the melons, they may come to the hedgerows. And our, our, our beneficials and predators have a place to feed on them all the time. And so that's, that's part of the, the program uh, to kind of capture some of, those, some of those pests before they come into our melon fields. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I have, we have another question um, from about beneficials. I, I have to admit, I love the study of beneficial insects and just entomology in general. I think it was probably my favorite class in college. I love talking about parasitic <laughs> insects. Anyway, so this is great. I'm glad there's lots of questions. So Daniel Martinez has a question for you. Um, so we will unmute Daniel. <laughs> um, hi. Um, how much are you spending a year in buying these insects that are you, you're using for your plantation? Um, I can't t tell you off the top of my head what it is per year, but we probably spend about $1,500 a week on insects. So it adds yeah. up. It is quite a bit. Absolutely. And the other thing about it is you're taking, you know, lots of people would say you're taking land out of production, right, to, to put those hedgerows in. But for you, Joe, I'm assuming that the organic production and the probably the difference in price that you're receiving uh, from Whole Foods and from others not only makes up for it, but obviously has, has got to be part of your production practices or else you wouldn't be as successful. Right, and you know, we talk to our customers like Whole Foods and um, we actually like to think of them as partners because uh, mm -hmm. we're not just selling them product over the phone. We go and talk to them in person and we talk about the issues that we have in farming. Yeah. Uh, I had a meeting with them back in, uh, in February and we went to their office and talked to them. And this is not the first time we, we do this, uh, try to do this every year. But we tell them about the issues, about the issues like uh, like the high costs of, of pest control, the increasing costs of labor. You know, our labor here in California is increasing by a dollar an hour every year. Uh, we talk to them about water and so forth. And they and they get they get to understand that. And so when we tell them, look, you know, we need this much um, for our melons to be able to pay for all this. And, and we're gonna do, you know, everything to give you the best cantaloupe you can eat and, and, and reliably. And so they understand that. And we go into a program with them actually, where we say, okay, we'll buy you these melons, you know, through the year at this price. And, and then we don't have to worry about haggling prices with them anymore. So that's a great that's a great part of our program. Takes a lot of our risk out of it. That's right. So one, I've got another question here from uh, Hannah Endress. So we'll unmute her and she can ask her question. Okay. Okay, Hannah. Um, I, ready. I don't know if I'm on. You're good. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Um. All right. Cool. So is there an off season when you don't use the insects? And if there is, what do you do with them? There is actually, um, <clears throat> typically by the end of the, of the summer or fall, mm -hmm. these insects are looking for places to go and, uh, and over winter. Mm -hmm. um, we, in the past, we, you know, we don't know where they go to, but what we're, one of the programs we're trying to do now is to establish some permanent habitat areas where they can go to for the winter. Now, I don't know how, how successful we'll be at that, uh, but if it works, we're, we're gonna try to keep them, as many of them as we can on the farm uh, so that they don't leave or die. That's right. Okay, Joe, I see there's some action behind you. So- There is. So just, so tell us what we're seeing describe what's happening well we have a tractor uh running here behind us and it's uh we're we're trans hold on a second just lost you yep there you go <laughs> yeah okay so are you there okay yep. uh so we're transplanting hard squash here um this is a new crop for us um and uh we're doing us we're doing small amounts our plantings are 
literally just uh you know two or three acres right now until we get you know get the hang of this but uh this this planter back here is three row planter same planter we use for cantaloupes and watermelons um there it's dropping plants at the prescribed uh spacing it it, it uh gives them a shot of water and then it, it it folds the dirt over the roots so so that they'll get established joe can you can you do a little running and run up to the planter so we can see it <laughs> all right here we go hold on <laughs> <laughs> there he goes he's he's walking fast all right okay <laughs> all right oh, yeah. there we go a little faster than the camera so here we are and um let me get up a little closer buenos dias mm -hmm. yay yeah, yeah. there they are okay so i don't know if you yep all right so there they are you'll see some people that are dropping the plants in the little carousel that drops it down into the row so i don't know if you can see that uh and then down here oh yeah You can see where the plants are uh, planted in. We've given them a shot of water, and uh, and they should be they should be well. Once we got them in there, you know they they're planted and and they're they're they'll sit there for a week or so, get adjusted, and then they take off growing. Yes. So Joe, um, let's. This is a great time to talk a little bit about about labor. Um, yes. You you discussed it uh, a bit earlier with the, the cost of production. And I know that you take a lot of pride in, uh, you've got crews there and people that have been working for you for a long time, uh, and that their safety and their health is of utmost uh, importance to you. So do you wanna talk a little bit about the kinds of measures that you've put into place with COVID-19 and, and things you do on a regular basis on your farm? Sure. Labor, we, we realized this a long, long time ago that our, our workforce is going to be part of our strength. Uh, we can grow melons, but can you pick them and pack them and sell them? That's a big part of our business. And uh, in order to do that, we need skilled people. So these folks, we teach them what we want, what our customer wants, what does Whole Foods want? What does Publix in the Southeast want? And, um, and we, pride ourselves in, in putting out uh, the top quality product that you can get, not just because it's organic, but we'll put ours up against anything. Uh, so in order to do that, we want to have the same people working for us year after year. And that's important. This crew behind us, the supervisor, Pablo Barrera, he's probably been with us between 15 and 20 years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of his people follow him every year. They come back every year. And, and, and it's important to us that day one, when we start harvesting a crop, we have people that know, they know exactly what they're doing from day one. And in order to do that, we do everything we can to have these people want to come back to us. And, you know, a lot of it is, is treating them well, but, you know, making them understand that we care about them. And so during times of, of, of COVID-19, you know, we want to make sure they're taken care of. We have, um, when we started hearing about COVID-19, we realized that our food safety program, which is very stringent, has a lot of protections against, uh, against this virus. Used to be that we were trying to protect the consumer from illnesses coming from our workers. Now we have to take care of workers from our workers. Mm -hmm. And so in, in addition to a lot of hand washing, which we've always done, we have hand washing stations everywhere. Um, you know, we, we added stuff like the social distancing and the, and the masks and so forth. Um, we do training. We, we sit down with the crew uh, and for 10, 15 minutes, we talk about, about COVID try to give them the most recent information that we have. And of course, this is all new to us, right? So we've been learning about COVID uh, from since March. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is be in contact with these folks, explain to them everything that we hear, because they may not hear it. 
and, and get them to understand what this is, how to protect themselves. And, and so that we know that, that we're, we're going to try to be uh, a good resource for them to understand how to, how to be safe. That's right. So, um, Daniel, earlier has another question about um, about labor. So, Daniel, all right, let's see. Letty, you want to unmute Daniel? Okay, Daniel, ask your question. Um, how much time do your workers get in a day? How much time do they have to work? Okay, so a law was passed in California, um, AB 1066, that cut down their work week. You know, we used to work basically our, our work week was 60 hours a week. Sometimes we go overtime in the harvest, work 65 hours a week then. Now um, this AB 1066 has cut their work week down. This year it's, uh, it's 50 hours a week. And so they're working shorter hours, um, very seldom wor working on Sunday. Uh, next year, it's gonna, the work week is going, due to this law, it's going to be cut down to 45. The following year, they're on, it's only going to be 40. Um, we're increasing the minimum wage, of course, at the, simultaneously, but, uh, but the folks aren't happy with these short hours. I, I will tell you that. I hear from them all the time. They're not happy. These folks, they're just like my folks when they came to this country. They wanted to work all the hours they could because they want to provide for their families. So um, if, you know, if you hear that somebody out there says, well, the farmers are you know, working them to death and all that, it's totally false. Uh, we work with them and uh, we try to stay you know, within the law uh, of the work week and, um, and, and do the best we can uh, with less hours. That actually, having a shorter work week will actually contribute to a labor shortage this summer. It's definitely going. So um, one more question on the labor thing, because I, I thought, found this extremely interesting when I visited with you, I believe it was last week ago, was the study that you were doing about heat and heat stress. And you guys study uh, around how to make sure that they are not getting heat stress showing the fluctuations of temperatures of their bodies. I'm not doing a good job of describing it, but I'd love to have you talk about that because it's really interesting and the kind of work that's happening with farmers to help make sure that their, their workers are safe. Well, heat stress is a very important um, uh, issue for us, um, especially for new workers. Seasoned workers like these, you know, that start in March, in the work and every day they've already become acclimated so when the temperatures here are going to reach 90 degrees sometime this week or next they're acclimated and these folks work every every summer uh out here for us uh, so they understand that when we have new workers um people who are not used to working in the field people who don't come from agriculture we have to be very careful with them and so we do a lot of training um our supervisors like pablo uh, we bring them in once a year and we give them nine hours of class talking about things like, like heat stress, talking about two hours of heat stress, two hours of sexual harassment prevention, um, you know, CPR first aid and all these sort of things, nine hours of the class. Then, we, then when the crew comes in, we give them a brief training of a lot of those things. Um, but it's very important that they, they understand how to protect themselves. And we, we provide them with everything that we can that, that will help them. I mean, we provide them endless water to drink cold water. It's always there. We provide them, you know, um, with uh, shades. We pro every crew has their own shade uh, trailer that has, has, um, has benches in it and, and a canopy over to the top so that they can go in on their breaks and rest in the shade and, um, and if they feel ill you know they, they can go over there and rest for a few minutes so that they can get the benefits and recover the time. Thank you Joe. Um, we're, I, we, we not surprisingly 
we're, we're already at, at 11.05, and I can just keep asking you all kinds of questions. I know you're extremely and I really want to say thank you again for joining us this morning. And if there's any last words that you have, it would be great to hear them, because I always love hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you for inviting me to come and, and talk to this group. Uh, follow us on um, on um, Facebook, Dolbosky Farms, and Instagram. You'll learn more about our farm there and the things that we do. So, go you know, follow us. Perfect way to to, uh, to 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 end. I'm going to mute you, Joe, because there was a little bit of, of wind there. Um, but Joe is on Twitter and the farm is on twitter and the farm is on instagram at del bosque farms and joe is on there as well you can also search west side farmer that's how he comes up as well so please follow me had a really cool uh video this morning that i was watching of a ladybug eating aphids it was super cool <laughs> that he was he shared from somebody else but it was a very very cool video so Thanks again, Joe. Have a great day, and uh, we'll hopefully see you soon. I don't know when, but hopefully soon. Thanks so much for all your support. Bye. <laughs>